To understand the unlikely journey that has been Burkett's life, you must first understand the guiding principles that fuel the fire of this fourth generation Mississippi farmer, who never stops working, whether he's on or off his tractor. The importance of small farmers, the importance of everybody in the world having the right to high quality fresh food. The sermon of food sovereignty and the significance of the small farmer is one Ben preaches not just to his neighbor down the road, but to the most influential policymakers as well. The, per the president of the UN sponsored a meeting about food sovereignty, the right to good, wholesome food for everybody in the world. And it was four of us, that, five of us that take, in, invited to be on the panel. Only four was on the panel. I wasn't one, wasn't them, but I had was given three minutes to respond to the questions. Now, North American Free Trade Agreement which I think was signed somewhere around 92 or 93. Uh, at the time, I was one of the few farmers, small farmers, was in favor of that. I'm not totally convinced I was wrong because it made a trade imbalance between Mexico and Canada and, and, and it almost put all the small farmers out of business. But to truly understand how Ben Burkett ended up addressing the UN, it is important to understand where his journey began. I'm down 32 Ben Burkett Road. It's a road named after my father. My family have been farming him for a little over 120 years almost. I'm the fourth generation to farm the same land. In 1889, few of the promises made to recently freed slaves were realized in the Deep South. Jim Crow, separate but equal, and deep-seated bigotry made the political and economic aspirations of most blacks, including farmers, unattainable. At a time when most Southern African Americans found themselves sharecropping for others, George Tisdale, Ben's great-grandfather, purchased 164 acres of land. Good land, sand alone, grow almost anything. Ben attended college at the historically black Alcorn State University. At Alcorn, it taught you some good things about farming. A lot of it was structured, you know, in the books and everything, but basically it taught you the scientific part of farming, but farming is a, is a science that you basically learn from one generation to the other. Ben is also a member of the Federation of Southern Cooperatives Land Assistance Fund. The Federation was created in 1967 as an extension of the civil rights movement to organize farmers and landowners into cooperatives for economic and social justice in southern rural communities. These farmers and landowners are leaders in their own communities. It is as a farmer and a leader where Ben Burkett's story begins. Growing up on the farm when I was young, we had, my father was a full-time farmer. He raised cotton, cucumbers, corn, peas, the money crop was cotton. Everything was done by hand. I had to pick cotton, chop cotton. We raised cotton all the way up in the late 70s, early 80s. With the migration of Mississippi blacks to Chicago in the late 1960s and early 70s, the legacy of the Burkhead farm was nearly broken. Well, it was my intention in 1973 to go with all my, everybody else in this community was leaving here going north. Chicago, so I was gonna go to Chicago. But my father got sick. We were growing cotton at the time, so my mother asked me to come help finish that crop out. So I came, helped finish the crop out, and it was a good crop. Made good money. I said, well, I like this farming pretty good, so I just, the next year I did good, but the third year, I didn't do anything. So I just stayed in and I was kind of tricked, but I wasn't tricked neither. Cause I could have left after that first year, but I made such a good amount of money. 
I stayed. He loves people, he loves to work with people, and he loves, the, uh, he loves agriculture. He loves working uh, with small farmers throughout the state. And I think that has been very helpful because of his knowledge and his background in that area. And his experience in that area has certainly enabled the farmers and cooperatives that we work with, and, and most of the cooperatives that we work with are agriculture cooperatives. So Ben's background has really enabled those small farmers to, uh, to develop and to increase their production and to market their production very, very, um, much more than they had been doing. I started farming to sell on my own in 1973. I've been farming ever since on this land here and lease land for my family in this community. And myself, my nephew, which my mom and dad raised, Melvin was still, was still helping me in the farming business. And all of us worked in, as a unit in this community. There was a number of farmers then, small farmers. I mean, 40 to 50 in this community. Now it might be seven, eight. The farm kept turning out a profit until the late 1970s. But then cotton prices dropped and soybeans decreased to half their value. Farmers started going bankrupt, and those who managed to hold on had to start rethinking the way they did business, and fast. And never been a farmer can say he farmed by himself. You always got to have somebody helping you. Ain't not one thing you can do on a farm successful by yourself. Ben and other small black farmers realized that the only way they were going to survive the tough economic times and racial discrimination was to pool their resources and to cooperate with each other. Based on necessity and this spirit of cooperation, they too became part of the fast-growing cooperative movement that had caught on in the Deep South among black farmers and rural communities. With the assistance of the Federation of Southern Cooperatives, a small group of black farmers in the Sheep Low community put their heads and money together and formed the Indian Springs Farmers Co-op. 1978, we were selling watermelons to brokers. And somehow or we found out that they were paying the white farmer one price and those black farmers another price. So we decided, we just put our money together and we bought two old tin wheeler, gas burner. They would haul around eight, nine hundred watermelon. And we loaded those trucks up and we started going to Chicago, sending our own watermelon to different buyers and grocery stores. Loading the trucks with their crops, the farmers would make run after run after run up to the city, where they would usually sell out within one day. And so the co-op, they, I can remember when it first started off, the men in the community would come out to my daddy's place behind and we, they would wash greens in old bathtubs and, um, and box them up outside. It would be freezing cold and I'd be running around out there getting hollered at. But I, I can remember them washing them greens out there in the rain in them old bathtubs and boxing them and icing them and putting them on the truck and taking them to, to the market. Why well, Chicago? Cause we know a lot of people up there from Mississippi and they, a lot of them want Mississippi watermelon peas, okra, and, and other stuff that we grow. Basically, that's how we developed the co-op, out of that effort to move our products into, for a more better price. That's the main thing about it. Discrimination put, a, put us in the trucking bin. And, the, and, and it really gave the co-op a boost to become better organized. But we had a rattling point as to why we were doing what we were doing. While working on distribution deals through the co-op at home, he also hit the road and began teaching and talking with other developing co-ops in the Federation. Working his way across Alabama, Georgia, and South Carolina, then coast to coast. 
Well, I went to a, a, a co-op meeting in 1978 in Braxton, Mississippi, at uh, C.J. Jones' house. And my co-worker, Ms. Melba Smith, was there talking about the Federation and the Emergency Land Fund work and what all they do to help small farmers. I think four or five of us went up there. Ben started working with the Emergency Land Fund probably around 1977, 76, 77. I had been there probably about two or three years. So he came on not long after I did. My role was, was saving the land, his role was developing the land in, in, in a sustainable way. Ben has worked at, for the, worked at, at, a, at a federation of leadership, in a key leadership role. You know, um, he has worked as, he's a person that has been able to pull farmers and rural communities together around issues of important, whether it's a farm bill, whether it's legislation to promote cooperatives, or legislation or policy to deal with wealth creation, or just straight out developing uh, markets for farmers and rural communities across the South. Ben has been that person that has uh, the unique ability to get things done. And being worked best though when, th when, when times are hard and it's critical. And that's why Ben's role is so important. Uh, the uh, Federation of Southern Cooperatives is a major organization. When it comes to small farmers in, in America, Ben is a leader of that organization. Uh, and, uh, and he just has so much to give because he has knowledge. From the bottom of his rugged boots to the top of his distinguished head, Ben is a farmer. He's a man who toils in the dirt, but he also organizes small farmers for economic empowerment and was asked to speak before the UN on the importance of small farmers and food sovereignty. However, that is not the full extent of Ben Burkett. People that go places, they come back and they talk about it, or it seems as if they brag or something about it. But you never would know, because he never would. He never would say if, you know, he would say, "Well, I visit there, and did a little work," or he might say, "I was out of town." But when you think out of town, you thinking, you know, maybe within a couple of states or something, and he would be out the country. And he would come back and he would tell me, I learned farmer, you know, say farmer A grows tomatoes this way. And I think we should try. But he never would say that farmer A was over there in China or somewhere until recently I started paying attention to people saying, Ben traveled to Zimbabwe and help farmers over there uh, get their crops back together for food supply or the shortage. I started working for the Federation of Southern Cooperative off and on in 1986, and I guess that's where it started from. Serving as the coordinator here for Mississippi to work with the cooperative members in the state of Mississippi. I think the first trip I went on in 1985, I went to the Philippine Islands to as a farm representative for the Federation and on, on the exchange and from there I've been, been fortunate enough to travel all over the world, either for the Federation or for a different organization or sometimes I travel on my own time, a few times. <laughs> Ben has lectured on everything from raising honeybees to credit unions to export readiness issues, bringing home everything from new irrigation techniques to market information. He's worked his way across Israel to the north and south, east, west, and central Africa, all across Europe, throughout Central America, the Philippines, Mexico, and Canada. Ben's role has been, has been very important. Again just by the fact that we're racing, kind of diminishing that culture line and, and getting rid of that. Ben comes home with it. Ben, you know, once, once we get through with a segment of the project and 
we've done certain things that we've set out to do, the initial assessments and things of that nature. Ben kind of stays right on top of it. You'll find he stays in contact with those farmers. Ben, when he takes his vacation time, Ben always goes to Africa. Now he goes, whether we got the money to do, the, to do some of the work that we need to do, he goes over and he does it just on this vacation time because he becomes very intertwined in the lives of those farmers that we work with. He does a very good job of that and, you know, and it, it has helped me to start doing the same thing. I kind of work in the same manner, uh, but it's by being guidance, I think, that I've, that I've been able to grow in that, in that matter. Well, you know, a lot of people don't realize that Ben is really a world traveler. He's just been all over the world making contacts. He knows people all over the world. He knows people all over the United States. And a lot of times people think, well, they just grow down in the area of the state and they sell to some local markets, or maybe they go up to Memphis occasionally, Mobile. But uh, he's one of the most knowledgeable people when it comes to marketing. And I think those are strong points that Ben has been able to develop. He's developed those markets. And, and to develop markets, you've got to have a person of trust and integrity. People have got to know when they say he's going to be there, he's going to be there. He's going to have quality product, which he always does. And they can always depend on him. If there's any problem, they can go back to him. Uh, ben has a great reputation, and that's what he's worked to do. Whether Ben is in a lecture hall at his alma mater, Alcorn State, or speaking at a conference in Paris, what separates Ben from so many others is his ability to connect with everyone, from a humble farmer to an inspiring political star. My recollection is that I met Ben uh, as a part of my congressional campaign back in 1985. Uh, so uh, I was an unknown candidate, uh, had uh, I'd never run for any public office before. And uh, of course, the district that I wanted to serve uh, as congressman for was primarily a, an agricultural district, a, a farming district. I met Mike when he first ran for the House of Representatives in 1985. Right there in front of the emergency, the Federation office. He was walking up, down the street and I was walking up the street. And I we shook hands and we talked about he was running for the U.S. House of Representatives. Although I wasn't in the second Congress in the district, I know a lot of people in the second Congress of Jesus. And I volunteered to work for his campaign and we were fortunate to get him elected. So here I am as, as an aspiring, uh, you know, member of the U.S. House of Representatives from a farm district and I knew really nothing about farming so I reached out to, uh, to people like Ben Burkett, you know, uh, people who, who were farmers and obviously were experts in, 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 the, in the vocation. And I, uh, I uh, formed an advisor committee uh, for my candidacy, and Ben was a, a key part of that advisor committee. So this was 1985. So uh, Ben traveled with me. He advised me on farm issues. He helped prepare me for debates with uh, an incumbent uh, congressman at that time. And we did pretty well. We won on first try. So one or two turns, and President Clinton was elected, and he was appointed. Secretary of Agriculture, and he turned around and appointed me to be on the state FSA committee, which I served a full term, eight years on the Clinton administration. I rose from just a member to becoming chairman of the FSA state committee for the state of Mississippi. Since that time, we've been very good friends. knows people and um, that's the stuff of politics so I, uh, I did my best to exhaust him uh, to use him not just for his mind but for uh, his personality and for his um, his Rolodex you know the people that he knew and so uh, he go with me uh, all the time on my campaign trips uh, throughout Mississippi uh, introduced me to people who, uh, who who he knew and I guess through his integrity and their their, uh, their belief in him, I was able to embrace him, and through that embrace, hopefully I was able to, uh, to get them to, to, to take a look at me. So 
it worked, we won, and we kept winning. We never lost a race until I resigned. I first met Ben Burkett about 1994. I was president of Mississippi Fruit and Vegetable Growers Association, and Ben was an active member, and that's when we first met. And he said he's gonna run for commissioner of agriculture for the great state of Mississippi. And would I support him, and I did. And since then, I've been supporting him. He'd been a friend of agriculture, small farmers, and I was appointed upon his recommendation to the state marketing board where I served two terms. And we've been involved in several other ventures to help small farmers recently. One of our members from Indian Spring Co-op, we went, went on a tour to North Carolina, and they would be funded with building a greenhouse. So all in all, my involvement with the commission has been ever since he's been elected. In addition to his continuing leadership role in the local co-op, Burkett is a lifelong member of Piney Grove Baptist Church and has been an active Mason for the past four decades. In this community, it's three institutions, so to say. You had the church, the large hall, and this co-op. I'm one of the few that's involved in all three of them. I've been a member of uh, Prince Hall Masonry for 39 years. My father and uncle all was founder of this lodge, and this lodge was founded in 1945. Been in existence ever since. And before we built the co-op, that where we have our meetings at, farmers meet, and we still have our farmer membership meeting there. My Piney Grove Missionary Baptist Church is the oldest institution in this community. Well over 125 years old. Again, my family played a major part in establishing the dead church. That is the center of the community. If you notice, that church is right dead center of this community. And it's, uh, you know, in the black community, that's, that's what we have, that we call out, that is ours. And we provide daycare there, computer classes. I've been fortunate to serve on the deacon board there since 1982. And I was a treasurer from 82 to 2002. I have been a member of that church all my life. Hurricane Katrina, August the 29th, 2005, hit this area. Category five hurricane, all of this was destroyed. Ben's strong ties to New Orleans and its people existed before the devastation brought on by Hurricane Katrina. Ben's role in our disaster relief efforts were the role that he plays most of the time, to, to be that farm advocate, to be that farmer on the scene, to be there when so farmers could see another farmer who was helping himself to show how, how it should be done. Uh, a lot of our efforts had gone on for some time before anybody even realized that Ben had been affected by Hurricane Katrina. I don't know if Ben's house is fixed to this day from Katrina. He'd always worked on the Gulf Coast in Mississippi and Alabama and especially in Louisiana, even where we had a shortage of staff. He filled that void. So he knew a lot of the people down there. He knew a lot of the farmers. He knew the network. So he was that, that entry point for us. The Crescent City Farm Market was founded in 1995. I've been one of the original vendors ever since then. We became members of the Crescent City Farm Market as in the spring farmers social, not as individual farmers. And to this very day, when we go to the market, we go as in the spring farmers association. It's about a little over 100 miles from here to New Orleans, and we grow, we pool our load together so that we can take it to the market. And from the being in the market, we have developed other relationships with restaurants, with wholesale suppliers, shipping companies, the cruise industry where we sell our produce to in the city and, and, and other places around New Orleans. His name 
will be left upon the community here and and probably in some of the other states and out the country as known as one of the best farmers in Mississippi. Hard working farmer, honest. Try to help as many people as I could. And I did. I like to see farming continue in this community. Somebody, my nephews, great nephews. I think the legacy that Uncle Ben will leave behind is very valuable and he he teach a, he's taught a lot of things to a lot of people and he's helped a lot of communities, helped a lot of groups and churches and things like that and he's just started off a lot of projects and he's, I mean, I think his legacy will be very helpful and just thankful for him. And he's a good man, I think. He's, I mean, he'll, he'll, be, he'll be thought about by many people and just used by a lot of people. It's hard to get young people to farm or they, they're looking for quick money. And there ain't no quick money in the farming business. You have to make a little all along. Well, under that, ben is, ben is also an example of what <clears throat> land retention and land development is about. Not only through his work, but through his personal life. You know, he's held on to his family's land for, for 100 years. And he's, a, he's an example of what we're trying to establish throughout the South. Hold on to the land, utilize the land, make it an asset, not just for you and your family, but for the community as well. I would define or describe Ben as a farmer. You know, everything he does is around farming. You know, he's a he's a he's an advocate, and he, and he doesn't consider himself an advocate. I guess that's the beautiful part about it, because when somebody's advocating on what they truly believe, it becomes like second nature. Ben is a true organizer. Ben is a true um, community leader. Ben, you know, for, and Ben worked at this from his heart, and that's the important part about it. Ben Burkett was one of those guys that first brought farmers together in cooperatives, showed them how to grow, showed them how to market, showed them how to be successful, and showed them that in numbers there's power because you can buy uh, with more people in your group, you can buy at better prices, they can buy their fertilizer, their seed, their equipment, cheaper as a group going together and buying. And then when they get ready to sell, they've got more produce and they can shop more markets. So I think those things that Ben has taught people in this state and taught them in all across this country and has even shared with people all across the world, people who look back and say, this guy was a real pioneer, a real visionary in what small farmers can do to be successful and profitable. And I think it's a lot to be proud of. His job, his passion, his life. Personally, farming have been real good to me. <laughs>